This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Hiroja Shy. Hello, it's Hiroja Shy here with another episode of Musings of the Shy podcast. On this episode, we are going to get into it. We are going to cover Segwit 2X. What is it? Why are there two different Segwits out there? What is entailed in the actual agreement, like the technical aspects of it? Uh, the code has been released, and there's been some criticism of it. There's actually been criticism of just the overall nature of uh, Segwit 2X, but uh, let's get into it before we get into it, the news. Uh, false rumors in China and Russia concerning Ethereum caused the, pri- the price to drop. So, Ethereum fails as a massive token sale of this uh, crypto mania to appear false rumor about the provision of the part of Russia, China, and Europe of ETH. Something false that it caused a panic for investors. Uh, this article comes from Hearts of Farah. Uh, it's written by Roberto, Roberto Sol. A few hours ago, we have commented on the sudden collapse of the Ethereum price, falling in an excessive manner, selling a large volume of Krypton's coins as certified by the graph that we published, with the other information where we commented on the fall, which we will add at the end of the post. While we spent a few hours researching everywhere, it's been complicated to gather all the information, searching in the forums, Twitter accounts, and several other sites. But in the end, we found the origin of the problem. We had found the reason for the drop. The Kraken chat gave us the information we were looking for. Apparently, the fall was due to a false rumor that Russia, China, and Europe have suddenly unexpectedly changed their plans and are coming together to block Ethereum. This information as it could not be otherwise than provoke a stampede in international exchange, exchange houses such as Polynix, where the Great Fall has taken place, while the exchange houses of China, South Korea, and Japan. Uh, they have not been distributed, disturbed by this information. Uh, Kraken, like Polynix, Bitrex, and other exchange houses have been affected and have suffered a massive stock sale. At the moment, the fall is maintained, although there are, there, there are experts who point out that in a few hours, should return to the green and fight in volume transactions with Bitcoin. It is expected to be that by the end of the week, Ethereum uh, will again be at $320, a value that has not reached steadily for several weeks, only in point peaks. Many users who have sold their Ethereum out of panic have lost enough capital due to the unfound rumor. It's unknown who or what, who or who uh, has launched the rumor or the origin of it, but the purpose is clear. Throw the price of Ethereum, both with the dollars and Bitcoin, to buy large quantities of stock for a small price. This is not a massive purchase, and they're still selling important packages to Ethereum, but it's possible in order not to raise suspicion. Uh, they will be buying small packages of this uh, crypto in the next hours. So, yeah, Ethereum's having some some issues over there. No regulation, no problem. Colombia wants to tax Bitcoin users. This comes from Crypto uh, CryptoCoin News. Uh, as obviously reported by CCNN, this, uh, Supertinia de Sodosa, an organization associated with the Colombian Ministry of Commerce, has in the past announced that additional currencies are allowed in Colombia, including Bitcoin. The only valid currency in the country is the peso. The announcement was made by Francisco Reyes Valmiras, who assured Colombians that the only entity allowed to issue money in Colombia is the Banca de la Republic, the country's central bank. Now, thanks to Bitcoin's growing popularity, the Colombian government Seemingly wants something to do with the cryptocurrency. As trading volume keeps growing, according to data from CoinDance, despite its lacking a legal framework in the country, those who invest in Bitcoin, according to the Colombian publication of America, need to declare their earnings because it's a high risk investment in the government's eyes. Being an investment is taxable. An analysis of the publication poll claimed the fact that the government didn't release an official statement on these investments doesn't exempt investors from declaring their earnings. Attorney Juan Sebastian, according to uh, Pan Am Post, stated that people need to Report the cryptocurrency investment profits on their tax returns. Since Bitcoin are part of people's assets, the attorney stated they need to follow corresponding tax rules. He also claimed that cryptocurrency raised concerns among tax authorities in order in other countries because its semi-anonymous nature allows people to evade tie in taxes. Moral Bitcoin expert Jonathan Alexander Hager stated that currently in Colombia, people are not required to report their investments or transactions in Bitcoin or any other cri- cri- cryptocurrency. So it can be used to evade taxes. Users can invest in this virtual currency through platforms such as Kraken, they stamp local Bitcoins, and Polonix. On the other hand, the director of Colombia Bitcoin Foundation, Carlos Mesa, pointed out that the Dion, or director Directores de Impostos y Adonis Nostros de Colombia, hasn't clarified anything, and as such, Bitcoiners who do want to declare their earnings don't know how to proceed. Nevertheless, reports show, suggest that the financial superintendent of Colombia is planning on implementing tax rules over earnings generated through the sale of cryptocurrencies despite the lack of regulation. The Colombian government is the only one trying to cash in on Bitcoin's growing popularity. After warning people not to invest in the cryptocurrency a few years ago, as reported by CCNN, the Portuguese government also wants to tax Bitcoin despite a lack of regulation in the country. And according to the country's Minister of Finance, as long as cryptocurrency earnings come from 
the professional or business activity, they should be declared as a tax. On the other hand, Japan, the country that decided to legalize Bitcoin recently, ended a 8% consumption tax on the cryptocurrency. So yeah, everyone wants to start taxes up. Burger King in Russia to accept Bitcoin as payment for its fast food. Uh, this is from Coindollar.com, written by Nina Long. Because of the growing popularity of digital currencies, chains of fast food restaurant, Burger King is in Russia, will accept Bitcoin in 2017. Dmitry Medvedev, the general director of Burger King Russia, said that the company will announce the winner of a, te- of a tender for the development of software that should, should allow restaurants to accept Bitcoin as payment for the fast food by August 10th. The company that gets the tender will have to develop software for payment via Bitcoin through Bitcoin, Burger King's website, iOS, and Android mobile apps, as well as cash registers. Uh, Dmitry Medvedev noted that the main difficulty the company will face is tax issues. The legal status, status of cryptocurrency and taxes are not yet defined in Russian Federation. However, he added the payments of cryptocurrency will be available soon. He said that Burger King is actively monitoring new trends, so we decided to start the project. Uh, payment with cryptocurrency in the near future. One of the representatives of the company also noted that customers of Burger King in Russia often ask the possibility of payment with Ethereum. But currently, Bitcoin plans to focus on those two cryptocurrencies. One of the Burger King branches in Netherlands has also added a list of businesses that accept Bitcoin payments in 2016. So this might be just a ramp up in Russia. Uh, a change is supposed to happen where Russia is going to start regulating Bitcoin as being something that you can do within their country lawfully. Uh, South Korea sets up a task force to determine if Bitcoin needs regulation by Kevin Helms. This is from Bitcoin.com. Bitcoin.com recently reported on a uh, rep. Park Eugene of the ruling Democratic Party of South Korea preparing a bill to provide Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other digital currency with a legal framework. Following lawmaker Park's efforts towards digital currency legislation, Business Korea reported that the South Korea Financial Supervisor Commission is taking a prudent approach according to the officials of the commission. Currently, a relevant ta- task force team is studying overseas cases to determine whether or not regulators are needed. Nothing has been uh, decided about the legislation of the bill about virtual currencies. The similar move by other currents, other countries. South Korea is not the only country to set up a task force to evaluate if Bitcoin should be regulated, nor is it the only country looking to others for examples. Recently, India announced that it would set up a task force to come up with recommendations regarding Bitcoin regulations, which are expected in six months. In Southeast Asia, the Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand also ordered the country's central bank to study Bitcoin and learn from other countries as well. In addition, he proposed creating a dedicated FedTech unit that can explore the opportunities presented by Bitcoin. While several countries are still evaluating whether to regulate Bitcoin, the Korean Financial Super- Supervisory Commission noted that Japan stands out as having already revised its laws to recognize and regulate cryptocurrency. Possible needs for regulation. Uh, domestic Bitcoin exchanges in South Korea, such as BitThumb, Corbit, and Coinline, and CoinPlug, are not subject to regulation and oversight by financial authorities. Unlike other financial institutions in the country, however, large-scale transactions are being made through them. Lawmaker Park pointed out that currently these exchanges receive about 6.5 billion won, or 5.8 billion U.S. a day, but 0.5% of the transaction money as commission. Even though they, are, they were established without a license from financial authorities, Business Korea then quoted him saying, No legal, legal regula- regulation in Korea has led to the definition of virtual currency, and furthermore, made virtual currency-related activities as a whole illegal. Korea must make a decision in terms of law and system. Currently, all these exchanges are registered and operated as telecom vendors. They can be open for business immediately after they report it. The lack of relevant laws has led each Bitcoin exchange to set up its own security regulations, explaining domestic cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, point one, compare, compared to financial institutions like bank, it's true that they're, 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 these are not enough. The publication quoted the exchange saying, For Coin9, we are building an exchange. The hand security system that includes not only our own security management, but also consulting services for security experts. In addition, the media outlet quoted an official of the South Korean Financial Service saying that legal guidelines are essential for insurance to compensate for the damage caused by virtual currency. Uh, so that's it for the news. On to segue to it. This has been a Hiroshi Shine Space Odyssey Network production. So segregated witness to X, segwit to X, the New York agreement or the very silver agreement. So here we go. We now know what segregated witness is. So what is segwit to X? What is this particular proposal? So this is, comes from BitcoinStockExchange.com. Uh, how is segregated to X different from segwit? Today, everyone got the news about the potential segwit to X adoption. However, I'm trying to understand why both of the, from the base of the same segwit principles, how they are different. Is it about block size, similarly, or is it about implementation? This is a question that was asked. So here's an answer. And I'm kind of 
skipping around here in the answers here, but the so Segway 2X is a combination of both SegWit and the 2 megabyte hard fork to activate three months after Segway. Segway 2X uses a different bit of signaling, that is bit 4 instead of bit 1, than um, SegWit. So SegWit is already in the system as after bit 1, and that's bit 141, but it has never reached a 95% mining hash rate that is required by bit 9 to activate. So in order to get SegWit 2X and not have a conflict with SegWit, it uses a different signaling method, which is bit 4. So here's a little bit of the difference. SegWit 2X differs in implementation because the activation of the 2 megabyte hard fork and the lower threshold of 80% of the mining hash rate. So they've changed the consensus rule here for this by saying you don't need 95%, you don't need bit 9 you can do it with 80%. Uh, SegWit bit 141, bit 148, bit 149 itself has been developed by a dozen of developers for over a year and has been tested extensively, extensively and has uh, been already for activation for some time now. It's also been successfully activated in Litecoin already. Since 2x however is being developed at the time of writing but by just a few non-core developers, although SegWit 2x aims to be minimalistic, some people can still consider this a risk because there's only a few months for development and only two weeks for testing. At the time of the writing, the percentage of block signaling support of SegWit 2x is 78% of the mining hash rate. There's the conundrum, because while there was an agreement in May to, to, to activate SegWit and do 2 megabyte hard fork, they're not activating BIP 141, they're also not activating BIP 148 or BIP 149, none of the BIPs. They're doing their own thing. And they're activating a 2 megabyte hard fork that's supposed to happen three months after SegWit is activated. So this is a totally different proposal. It's not coming from the cores. It's not utilizing the bits, but it uses the ideas from the bits, but it's not actually using their, their code or software implementation. And it, they just released the alpha release, like the end of June. So there is a bit of a time crunch. While for BIP 141, there wouldn't be a time crunch because you have all the way to November 15th of this year for that to get activated. There is a time crunch for this proposal because there is the other SegWit proposal, which is the user activated software, which is indicating that they were gonna they're gonna activate that protocol through nodes on August first. So we'll get into what that is and what that means. So they have to the, the individuals be responsible for SegWit 2x. The, the companies behind it have to develop the code, test the code, release the code for everyone to pretty much see, test it, implement it and do all this, uh, started in May, into May, mid-May, before August 1st, and start signaling and doing things before the August 1st deadline, so by the end of July of this of this month. That's really not a lot of time, and it's making a lot of people very, very, very nervous, uh, thinking that there's going to be a very bad code and it's going to wreck things. Or more importantly, that nothing really is going to happen and you're going to have in essence, um, a user activated soft work and get um, nothing's going to happen on the SegWit 2X and the miners aren't going to implement the code because um, it just hasn't been tested enough and they don't want to be responsible for breaking the network, if you will. But the user activated soft work people, the node people, will still go forward and then you can still have the chain split, if you will. Here's another little bit of information here. So SegWit Bit 141 is not active at the moment because it, it requires 75% of the mining hash rate. Not enough miners set, support a SegWit at the moment because most some because some miners want a hard fork to increase the block size. To work around this proposal of Bit 148 allows users to force the miners to mine SegWit blocks by offering other blocks after August 1st, 2017. Bit 149 is a similar proposal but will activate 11 months later. The vast majority of core developers prefer BIP 141, but most find BIP 148 and BIP 149 acceptable also. So this comes from Eric Lombazo, uh, June 26. So why SegWit 2X, or why not? Back in 2015, when the issue of increasing transactions throughput was submitted for review, the framing was off. People had talked about the block size limit ever since before Satoshi actually added the 1 megabyte limit originally in 2010. The framing has given all the new technology innovation that had taken place then, and I'll get back to that later. I wrote in my previous piece that since 2010, a number of soft forks have been deployed successfully, employing a series of mechanisms that are increasing in sophistication. By the middle of 2015, there have been a mastery of techniques for adding a bunch of new features at the Bitcoin consensus layer while preserving backwards compatibility and not disrupting the function of the network. Why is backwards compatibility important? Anyone who's ever worked in deployment of new software products knows the logistically difficulties of getting everyone to upgrade. This is even the case assuming there's no reasonable technical or political objections to the update. Whenever Microsoft releases a new version of Office, they may 
make sure to also create tools to read older for file formats and convert to newer ones. They know people will be using different versions at any given moment. Some people still even use Windows XP over 15 years old. Despite Microsoft no longer officially supporting it, they still release a fix for XP after the recent ransom attacks such as WannaCry. I bet most readers have had to endure the annoying nagging of their smart farm telling them, tell them it's time to update their operating system. Always wondering whether the update will break something and having to wait for the whole process to take to take place, not being able to use the device for a while. Blockchains are even more critical than operating systems in this regard. Everyone in the network must agree to the same consensus rules, and any change to the consensus rules potentially subject to the system to critical failure modes. We can continue hoping people update their software to something that continues to be supported, but it's impossible to be entirely certain. And for high, highly security sensitive issues, such as securing tens of billions of dollars worth of other people's assets, is of a paramount importance that people be able to buy, migrate easily without the worry of potential serious security threats. And to logistically difficulties, the potential for divergence of economic interests and you can risk system attacks and chain splits. In most other kinds of systems, flux are not necessarily such a problem. You need some competition and divergence in the system for it to result, for it to evolve. The consensus layer of the world's longest continually running and most highly cap capitalized blockchain is probably not the ideal place to be fighting these battles. Introduction of the incompatibility of the system is sometimes necessary to improve upon it, but also creates considerable friction. There's a strong inertia around a set of practices and standards, even if ad hoc. In the case of something like a word processor, it's always possible to add new features, but also to share tools that can convert old files and formats to new ones. Making a blockchain com backwards compatible. One of the break big breakthroughs that was taking place around 2015 was the discovery of a fairly generalized method for adding new consensus features to the protocol while retaining backwards compatibility. I went over distinctions between softworks and hardworks and the information in my previous piece. For a long time, it's been believed that since softworks can only make rules more strict or add new rules, the kind of new features we might add to the protocol will be limited. Should we be able to loosen or even get rid of or change rules completely affords more uh, extensibility, no? Well, it turns out that there does exist a class of changes for which softworks would not suffice. For instance, certain fixes to the block header format or proof of work issues. Perhaps surprisingly, it's possible to add just about any new transaction feature without the need for a hard fork, and in many instances, it's actually practical to do. The basic technique relies on commuting, committing to extra data by storing its hash, which is ignored by older nodes somewhere in the block, and it turns out that SegWit was a prime example where this technique was a superb choice. SegWit is a great example of this technique. The reason SegWit was a superb choice of this technique was because it had been clear for a while that sticking the signature data directly into the transaction structure itself has been a mistake in the uh, protocol's original design. Not only is it generally a good idea to be able to process the signature or witness data separately, it should not contribute to the transaction idea. Putting the signature data in a separate sector at once allows for more elaborate processes and essentially of it, i.e. more elaborate smart contracting scripts as well as fixing malleability since the transaction ID no longer depends on it. We can still include this data in the block by relating it together with the transaction to nodes that accept it and commit to a hash of it in the block itself. And this is yet another benefit we've created a new data structure that can be included in the blocks while still retaining compatibility with nodes the check limits of the older block structure. Older nodes cannot process the exit data, so cannot perform all validation checks. They will just ignore the data and process the blocks without it, but they can still perform all validation checks that exist prior to SegWit, so they can continue to transact on the network, send and receive transactions, even if they don't update. What this also means is that this extra block data is not subject to the one megabyte, megabyte block size limit. We can store more data in the blocks without breaking backwards compatibility with older nodes. This allows blocks to be much larger than one megabyte. Here's a 3.7 megabyte block on the Bitcoin test, test set done to test uh, edge cases, and you can click on the links in there if you want to view it. And not only does this mean we'll double capacity of typical transactions that take advantage of this feature, it also adds an incentive for cleaning up unspent outputs, UTXOs, which consume extra money when running a validated node, since uh, spins require signatures which can now be handled more efficiently across the entire system, and therefore are discontinued when get computing block totals. So why the 2x? Remember how I men mentioned earlier that the framing was off? It turns out that while the top protocol engineers were working on these ideas back in 2015, a particular solution had been sold to a number of companies, some of which are surprisingly little contact with most of the top protocol developers into the public. A superficially simple-looking change, which just involved increasing the, the base block size limit, a simple change to a single parameter, which results in a massively more complex dynamics than most people realize. This was done outside of the peer review process and was not grounded on sound science. 
While much easier to explain, basic block size increasing than something like SegWit, the full implication must be taken into consideration to understand why such a simplistic approach is highly problematic. Most critically, it breaks compatibility, and it does so in a way that pits some users' interests against others, creating a lot of friction without having much long-term justification since block holders end up filling up again and fees will once again rise. It essentially amounts to kicking the can down the road, but not really looking where you kick, and you can happen to kick it into the hornet's nest. It's... It is generally generally extremely hard to assess whether an incompatibility will create some perverse incentives or divergent interests or open up potential attack vectors that can lead to consensus failure or other secu- serious security problems. See, the thing with sophisticated attacks is you never see them coming until it's too late. For the pro, the smallest of opens is enough to pry open a huge gap, a huge gaping security hole. People are trying to attack this network 24-7. Again, we're talking about a blockchain whose principal purpose is secure what is now worth tens of billions of dollars of other people's money. Can we do a plain plain old base block size increase without consensus failure? Perhaps. Given the right political and economic circumstances, it's conceivable people would agree to a flag date and update software if done sufficiently in advance. But 2015, which is about the worst possible political environment for this type of things. I don't think the environment for this sort of thing is much better right now, but I'm hopeful it will be eventually improved. However, I'm not ready to put a schedule on it, and my advice is neither should you. Had an actual back, base back size increase have explored the economic consensus, someone might have just had gone ahead and done it, done it, and it would have effectively amounted to a secession. We could get a chain split, but this would be the desired intent. Despite people having done campaigns with rhetoric calling for a Bitcoin hard fork, not a single one of them to the date has been actually carried out very far. This is even despite the fact that the, ent- the entirety of the software needed to run a val- full validated node is open source and IP- MIT licensed, meaning anyone can freely make modifications and release their own version of it. But for the few literally minor incidents, no significant amount of cash empire has strayed from Bitcoin consistency rules and intent to hard fork, because the reality is that their blocks will ultimately end up getting rejected by the economic majority. Exchanges won't accept them, wallets won't accept them, users won't accept them. They would be considered the equivalent of a counterfeit or an altcoin. Nevertheless, unfortunately, by late 2015, the framing has gotten so bad that people are screaming for a 2 megabyte period. It's like a sudden frenzy, the entire population around a nuclear power plant decided they needed to double the size of the main reactor to keep up with the demand without considering any effects that might have on the proper functioning of the power plant. I mean, what could thought possibly go wrong, right? People forget about the stated objective and assess over a single technical parameter. So some people saw an opportunity for creating a wedge in the community, and perhaps to chan- chance them out a coup, or otherwise attack the network for their own gains. Coming with, up with a few examples of what is a left as an exercise for the reader. After many months of mailing list discussions throughout 2015 and two conferences, scaling Bitcoin open to the public, dedicated to topic scalability, and after talking to all the best Bitcoin protocol experts in the world, it's become clear that SegWit could effectively double the box size and fix a bunch of other problems as well, without breaking backward compatibility, and therefore without a serious risk of a chain split or consensus failure. But it was hard to predicate demands for the 2 megabyte hard fork, whether the demand was genuine or simply negotiation tactics employed by people, Looking to increase their direct influence over the big, over the protocol development, sometimes the, the judgment of the Bitcoin community as a whole. So here, here we're at. We have we're at this like kind of a fork in the world world road where there's several different parties basically vying for control or say of the protocol, and this could be a good thing or a bad thing depending on your perspective or your viewpoint. You know. Uh, Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin XT, and Bitcoin Unlimited went out there and put out their protocols to seek to try to get consensus. They never did. They didn't reach the same hashing power necessary to activate, if you will, um, to get the whole network. Now, they could have easily, you know, Bitcoin Unlimited, Bitcoin XT, Bitcoin Classic, sought to put the quote out, the the, um, the protocol out there and forked. They could have forked, uh, but that's not what happened. Uh, they were just really just trying to stay on chain and stay one single chain, if you will. And so even with the, the block size raisement, if you will, the two megabyte raise, uh, they have a reached consensus. SegWit, which was implemented into the protocol of the Bitcoin Core with the latest version and has been signaled uh, for BIP1, has all the way to November of this year uh, to be activated, BIP141, hasn't happened. So... We're in this very weird, contentious space where neither one of the solutions has, you know, consensus majority. They just don't. And each one has uh, different negative things to them. 
or SegWit has been um, tested uh, pretty hard uh, with the Bitcoin test network and its code BIP141 has been tested very extensively, even BIP148 and 149. Um, the 2 megabyte on the test network has been tested, but not as much. You have to look at two other altcoins to see uh, how they do things because they um, have larger block size and see the mining um, their mining capacity, the network capacity, their overall network effect to kind of look at them and see, you know, a bit of a comparison. But it's not quite the same because there's so much um, transaction and volume within the Bitcoin space. And really what it comes down to is it, it comes down to usability and feasibility. The fees are a barrier for a lot of people. And I don't think enough of that is an emphasis on uh, either side, really. Uh, it needs to be pennies or dimes. It needs to be pennies on the dollar to transact for every single transaction, whether it's a thousand, ten thousand, or a dollar. It, it really does if it wants to make, make itself a global thing. Because too many, too many economies are below five dollars a day to live off of, so they cannot utilize Bitcoin. They cannot do that. You you will not be the global uh, settlement. And as much as people say say that you know, and it is Bitcoin is a um, you know bear bonder, a saver, it's a way for you to economically save and have control of a monetary value yourself outside of. Uh, a government issue currency it's not really relevant to somebody who lives off of five dollars a day is their five dollars a day they're pretty much spending much of that capital and what they are saving is for essentials maybe uh, emergency purposes or um, they have children pushing their children up the economic ladder and investing into uh, something that has a very high transaction fee um, and volatility is still a little bit out there, and the ability to get it, which is already dif- difficult as it is, uh, it's just not it's not economically feasible for all. And that was the purpose of Bitcoin, or at least the initial concept or design was that this was going to be a monetary policy that would be good for all people. And right now, at its current state and its and its stalemate, it's it's just not there. It's not there for there. Um, we missed the ball when it comes to these exchanges. We didn't emphasize enough decentralization of the exchanges so that uh, people can put value in and um, you know fiat in and maybe stay within the network. They're not transacting out. Uh, because of that vector, it's very difficult with AML and KYC for people to acquire Bitcoin if you don't have a bank account, if you don't have a credit card account, maybe you don't have ID or information or you don't want to disclose that. You're not going to be able to name cryptocurrency in that fashion. And then you're going to have to go to places like local Bitcoin or um, some of these other decentralized places or offshoots where you're paying the exorbitant higher fee to order to obtain it. You're going to pay like an extra 100 bucks or 200 bucks to obtain Bitcoin because you're not going through the AML and KYC process. And that in itself is that in itself is a little bit a hindrance to acceptance of Bitcoin, where you're not making it the price point economically feasible for people to obtain. You're just not. And if you're allowing um, too much greed, if you're allowing too much of a, uh, I wouldn't say greed is completely bad, but an avarice, if you're allowing the avarice nature of a few uh, controlling that t- type of a sector, then again, you're not going to get as many people on you You're all, all you're getting is primarily first worlders, uh, primarily um within the western sphere you know the western part of the globe um, transacting here and you're not it's not going to really trickle down as much as many people think into the rest of the globe into south america even though there's no penetration it's not the big center it has um or even in africa and stuff and if you look at who is utilizing um bitcoin in those spaces it's people that already they're very similar to people that are already in the Western sphere. It's not everyday regular people. They're already tech heavy. They're already in the tech industry. They already have some economic means. So they already have a leg up, and so that gives them access. But people that don't have a leg up or are not tech heavy, they don't have access, it's, it's not feasible. And perhaps these changes will allow for it to be feasible. But right now, at this point um, in Bitcoin, it's not. So now what? So by the end of 2015, it's pretty clear that SegWit 
was a good way forward, and after considerable more testing and review, we've been waiting for SegWit to activate since the fall of 2016. The network is ready for the transition. It's been extensively tested on multiple dedicated test nets, and it's been active on the Bitcoin test net since May of 2016. And it's successfully activated on other blockchains, largely sharing source code with Bitcoin, such as Litecoin. It would avoid a chain split and all the branding issues that accompany that, as well as more severe economic implications. Many companies are ready for it, but unfortunately, as mentioned in my previous post, it was deployed in a way that gave a small hashing power minority vote veto power. This is in line with the conservative way of thinking that if deployment fails, status quo is to be preferred. But so this way of thinking has been shattered by the way in which this arbitrary veto power that developers gave miners has been abused to the point of extortion. Most miners have been cooperative, sometimes misinformed, and have just gotten stuck in the middle of something they never asked for. Reasonable requests from miners are always very welcome, but demands from a small handful of miners have gotten more and more ridiculous over time. There's a very good reason to believe that some of these people are not being honest about their motivation, and it's seriously hurting innovation, progress, and Bitcoin. And it's also hurting the vast majority of the miners who didn't ask to be stuck in the middle of this. If we cannot smoothly activate a tried and tested upgrade that has gone phenomenally well on other blockchains, such as Litecoin, there's very little chance of smoothly doing what amounts to a much more contentious change, a hard fork that's so contentious nobody has the guts to actually go through with it. But at this point, the activation nonsense is all just theater. It's literally impossible for miners to activate a hard fork without a near universal support of users. Users need to agree to change their software, and the soft fork signaling was an arbitrary system that was designed to give the ecosystem a smoother means of upgrading, but was mistaken by a few miners in the naturally given power, which they can now use for leverage to gain, o- gain other influence. Much of it is not even related to the protocol development, and it's gotten totally ridiculous and needs to stop. There's no reason why we must deploy softworks in, in this way in the future. The truth is, miners mainly provide a service of securing blockchains and generally follow whatever blockchain is most profitable to mine. They get rewarded for their services, and some some them very well. Miners get to build chains, but users get to decide which ones are valuable to them. We just hope that miners come to the senses and activate SegWit using BIP9 in July. Whether under the guise of SegWit 2x or not, and if not, we shall... We will start enforcing it itself as users on August 1st by running BIP148. If all goes well, we will see no chain split and Bitcoin will the moon. Once they would activate, it will no longer be necessary to run BIP148. Regardless of whether or not miners signal for SegWit 2x, it's ultimately up to users whether they accept this kind of change or not. Signaling for 2x, SegWit 2x is a miner and actually running it are two completely different things. It's crucial that regardless of what happens, SegWit activates on the 80 plus nodes out there that support it. Two months for serious consensus rule changes with little actual peer review doesn't seem like a smart bet. But as always, I believe in the, it is the right of everyone to run whatever software they want to run. And after years of practically no downtime and phenomenal security and network stability across the upgrade, I will continue to run Bitcoin, Bitcoin Core once SegWit active. So, um, yeah, so that's pretty much sums up most positions really about SegWit and user activated SegWit and just kind of the status and status of these proposals or this current proposal that we're going through right now. And, you know, Eric Lamaza is, you know, a Bitcoin Core developer, so he's he does have a bit of a say and, a, you know, a bit of a authority, if you will, on the subject matter. So kind of continuing on, Bitcoin scaling proposal Segwit2x moves ahead with initial code release. The working group behind the Segwit 2x Bitcoin scaling proposal has announced the first version of its code is now review, re- ready for review and testing. As such, the release proves, the, proves that the market with a first look at the technology underlay one of the most broadly supported bids to enhance the network. Announced in May as an agreement, the United Miners and Startups have said that 2x is an alternative technology roadmap to one proposed by Bitcoin Core, the network's open source developer group. It since emerged as a frequent subject of praise and criticism and discussion. However, it could be a promising sign. Segwit 2x could could become a moderate option that helps to avoid a contentious network split. And it looks like it would end up being somewhat compatible with alternative proposals. The user activated soft work of BIP148, which is coded, will activate on August 1st. The news is known because earlier this week, any compatibility between the two, two proposals seemed less likely as uh, discordance that raised fears of the split of the blockchain is two competing assets. The development becomes apparent on Wednesday when Bitcoin developer James Hillard submitted a change request along with a code change that reduced the time it takes for, Bit- for mining pools to lock the update. On GitHub, Hillard said that they should reduce the chance of a conflict with Bit 148. 
By reducing that time, many pools will have one or maybe two three-day periods in which they can lock in a controversial code change called segregated witness by signaling support using the SegWit 2x software before the user activated it occurs on August 1st. But it was unclear if mining pools would decide to do so. The request will, was well received, being met with several uh, ACK's developers shorthand for agree and a sign of approval. So yeah, they're playing a really big game with chicken here because they have to get this out before August 1st because that's when everyone's going to activate, or I should say, a lot of people are saying they're going to activate BIP 148 with these nodes. Uh, former timelines. The official release of Segway 2X includes a working version of the software which combines two changes, the scaling optimization of SegWit and an increase of 2 megabyte block size parameter. The increase to 2 megabytes is now scheduled for three months after SegWit activates, according to an email from BitGo CEO Mike Blush. Prior to this, it's been less clear, even to some SegWit 2X per- per- participants, when the 2 megabyte hard fork would take place. The SegWit 2X development has been moving quickly according to plan is the project in good shape, Bell said in a, mes- in a message to her working group. The 2 megabyte size has long been a point of contention, par- partially because it would lead to a blockchain split if not everyone agrees to upgrade to the new blockchain code. But some of the industry have already suggested they don't plan to. And our segment 2X is one to support the most major Bitcoin companies and mining for- firms is a total representing over 80% of the Bitcoin hash rate. But it remains unclear how reliable the support will be only partly to fatigue around the issue. With the Apple version out, the wider community now gets to review and test the software. The release also includes a new Bitcoin test net that developers can use to put the software through its cases and identify any bugs. The testing phase. Developers can trial the software using the test network called TestNet 5 for the next two weeks. We are planning to conduct rounds of testing against the new test net, including everyone from the working group and who, who would like to participate. Uh, BitPay senior developer Justin Lanks has sent another email to the working group. The plan for these rounds is to simulate code development life cycles from signaling support to SegWit to activating the 2 megabyte block size parameter. These rounds of testing are reviewed are aimed to help avoid any future network problems, such as in the worst case scenario, the loss of users' Bitcoin. Uh, security loosens. Feedback as SegWit 2x plan has already been rolling in. One working group participant argued that it's potential for replay attacks in the event of a hard fork. Replay attacks in the event of split leaving the community with two Bitcoin tokens could allow users to accidentally spend their their Bitcoin are both networks. Um, we'll talk about that when we talk about the negatives of these different proposals about replay. Uh, we saw this happen last year with the Ethereum split. This confusion happened last summer with Ethereum split into two coins, leaving some companies to lose money. The participants argued that protection from this confusion and potential dangerous issue is needed within Segwit 2x code, which is currently, as we're speaking, not there, and ni- neither is it in BIP 148. Some Bitcoin core developers have criticized Segwit 2x development timeline as being too short because it often takes a significant amount of time to catch all errors associated with the Bitcoin code changes. Segwit itself was tested for over a year before its launch. So far, though, Segwit 2x developers haven't skipped a beat, saying that this project will continue to move forward along the original timeline with a beta release scheduled for June 30th, and on July 21st, users will be able to run and single the full beta software according to the group. So yeah, they're barreling along the duo. You can find the GitHub of this code, and it's called BTC1 slash Bitcoin. This is where the um, the SegWit code is at right now. So it's 19, or at least it says, you know, Jeff Garjik version. So I have a link in the show notes. So it's out there for people to look at, kind of poke and prod. But there's been some issues about people getting on the test net. Uh, or even participating in the mailing list, where if you are not a supporter of Segwit 2x, you kind of either get kicked out or not added on, and this is very contentious for a lot of people, because even as much as uh, the Bitcoin core developers have been decried, if you will, you can talk a mad amount of shit to the Bitcoin core developers in the mailing list. You don't have to support whatever it is they're saying or doing, but you can participate in the mailing list, you can go and do go on the test net. There, there are no barriers, if you will. The second thing is the fact that um, it's not as open as people would like it to be. Um, but the Bitcoin Core, you can see everything is updated. Uh, you can download stuff, check it out yourself, and do whatever you want with it, if you will, to verify. But this doesn't seem to be the case as they're rushing this code out. And 
there's really just the same people that don't believe and the right right for this belief believe that there's enough time to catch all the bugs and so there's a lot of hesitation on people that may want segment two X to happen but are not like in the time frame and think that it should have more time if you will but it's not going to have more time because of the august 1st user activated soft work so that's it for this episode segue 2x it's um being tested as we speak it's go if you will would be july 26 to try to get out there before august 1st for fifth 148 uh, is backed by miners and different companies. It's be developed by Jeff Garzik and other developers. They're not core developers. They have their own little GitHub repository. They're going through the testnet phases. They have a really small window to get all the bugs and things of that nature out of the system before implementation. And again, even still, there is the issue is, will the miners activate SegWit? And then after they activate the segwit, will the two megabyte increase occur three months later? And there we are uh, when it comes to that proposal, what is it about, how it's different. Most importantly, it's important to note that it's not BIP 2141, is not BIP 148, is completely different. It may take aspects of those BIPs uh, about segregated witness that has already been out there, but is encoding something completely different. It's his own version of the concept of segregated witness through code. So thank you for listening and to the moon. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shy Space Odyssey Network production.